Okay, welcome to Professor Lesby's uh, textbook reviews. Um, and in this series, uh, I want to take a look at uh, Malik's uh, C++ programming uh, textbook, in particular, the eighth edition. Um, I know that uh, I'm using this uh, for a, a couple of, of different universities that I teach for. And what I find is a lot of times students that are new to programming, um, they need someone to kind of help guide them through the textbook in order to uh, put the, the pieces together. Okay, so that's kind of what uh, this, uh, this series is for. Uh, definitely, this is not a replacement uh, for the textbook. If you do not have the textbook, you need to go out and purchase the textbook, but I'm hoping to connect the dots uh, that uh, this particular textbook uh, contains and go through each of these these chapters um, and and talk about some of the high level concepts uh, in each of these these chapters. Uh, most of my students uh, find this useful in a classroom and I'm hoping that um, a lot of students uh, out there uh, in addition to my students will also find this useful. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in here. Um, this is the C++ programming uh, Malik textbook, eighth edition. Uh, let's go on into chapter one. That is what I would like to cover uh, today with this particular recording. And uh, we're going to see that chapter one is, is pretty much an overview of, uh, of C++ and, and programming languages uh, in general. OK, and so it uh, summarizes the key points here on, on the first page of chapter one. Uh, next page goes into right, some of the history uh, behind computers, which is always good knowledge. If, if you take a um, computer architecture course, you will definitely uh, get more into uh, these different, different historical facts. But again, uh, high level view as far as where computers are coming from so that when we start talking about programming, maybe uh, that'll make a little more a little more sense. Um, elements of a computer system. Yeah, um, this is also typically covered in an introduction to computers course, uh, but they hit it lightly here and, and basically let us know that every computer has input. We perform some some sort of process on it, and then we we have output. Uh, uh, useful output, right? We're taking the input that may be uh, somewhat convoluted or complicated, and we're performing a process on it and translating it into a nice human readable form, or maybe we are translating it into another form that another computer uh, would find useful, okay? But this is what's called the IPO paradigm, right? Where we take input, we process it, and we, uh, we come up with some data that is sent to output, okay? Uh, concerning that, um, there is some hardware involved, right, with a, with a computer. Uh, we have the CPU, uh, and that stands for the, the central processing unit. Um, different textbooks have different meanings for that. Uh, some people consider the, the tower that contains the motherboard and the processor, the CPU. Other textbooks, uh, other textbooks, uh, have the CPU meaning the actual processor, uh, and I think that's that's a little more uh, a little more correct, okay, uh, because the processor is the central point uh, where the the program is actually executed, and the processor, the CPU, is connected to main memory, right? That's where we are putting all of our our data at runtime and our programs at runtime into main memory. Um, and most computers utilize RAM that, uh, that helps them with, uh, that implements the main memory. Okay, and again, chapter one is just high level what is involved in a computer. And we will get into what a C++ program looks like here in a second. Uh, but again, from a, from a high level, here's the CPU or the actual processor right? Talking to main memory that is not inside of the CPU is typically on the motherboard 
where the CPU is located. And then um, when we have additional information that we need to maybe store for later, or uh, we, we don't have enough room in main memory for, we start to write that data to what's called secondary storage. And we'll see that that secondary storage can be anything from the cloud to a hard disk um, and things of that nature. But the key here is that the secondary storage is what's called non-volatile memory. So when we write data to secondary storage and we remove the power from the computer, that data is not erased, right? However, main memory is something called volatile memory. And when you remove the power uh, from the computer, everything in main memory is wiped out, right? So main memory is only used when, there's, when power is applied to the computer and the CPU is running a particular uh, application or program. Okay, so big difference between main memory and secondary storage, right? Volatile memory versus non-volatile memory. Um, and then the computer as a whole uh, needs to get input from somewhere, right? And that is what the input device is. There's all sorts of different input devices, and I think they go into it uh, on the next page. Uh, but once we grab those, that input from the keyboard, from the mouse, from, from whatever it may be, we process that information and then we come up with some output that, um, that, that we, we, we use to show the user what, what the process looked like, right? After we're done processing this input data, let's create some useful output data and show it to the user. Typical output device is something like uh, a monitor, right? Uh, but there's also other lots of other uh, output devices that can be used, especially if we're talking about robotics, right? Uh, each one of those servos uh, or motors is an output device that helps the robot move. And maybe the sensors on the robot would be your other input devices, okay? Um, all right, so yeah, next page talks about input and output devices, how we have a, a bunch of different uh, types, right? Uh, input devices consist of things like a keyboard, mouse, scanner, camera, uh, anything that's used to take input from the outside world. Output devices can be anything from a monitor to a printer to secondary storage, like a hard drive or flash drive, uh, or, or even I would, I would say the cloud in some instances. Okay. Um, Next page talks about software and, and there, we do need to distinguish between an operating system and an application, okay? Um, the operating system is the low level software that, uh, that is loaded onto the computer when you first turn the computer on, right? This is, uh, there's typically, around three or four major operating systems. Well, there's much more, but in, in the commercial industry, typically these are operating systems like Windows, right? Very popular for business. Um, Mac or OS X, very popular for uh, video and uh, graphics processing. Um, Linux and Unix, right? And even on cell phones, cell phones there, there are operating systems like Linux, uh, I'm sorry, um, iOS and Android. And again, there, there are many other operating systems, but those are the, the, the popular operating systems that uh, most computers have installed, right? And keep in mind your mobile device is a full-fledged computer now, okay? That used to not be the case, but for sure uh, the, the processor on your phone and the amount of memory on your phone uh, on the newer phones is just as good as um, your off the shelf, uh, low level laptop, okay? So the operating system is the software that, uh, that runs in the background that, in, that, that gives you what's called a GUI interface uh, and enables you to do different things to the system uh, at a high level, right? Application programs, 
are built on top of the operating system, right? And these are what they like to call in industry apps, right? And uh, these apps are typically written with a high level programming language, right? C++ is definitely uh, one of those languages that does allow you to write apps, but not only that, C++ also allows you to write some low level uh, driver code for the operating system. Um, and in fact, behind the scenes, most of these operating systems are written in C and C++. So as you can see, uh, C++ is a very uh, powerful language and uh, it has been around for a while uh, because it is so, so useful and in, ingrained in the industry, but also because of its speed. Um, we'll see that uh, C++ is one of the, the fastest uh, applications out there or, or programming languages that can create fast applications. Um, and it's used a lot for low level driver control where speed is a concern. So um, C++ can be used within the operating system environment, but for this particular course and this book, uh, they, they, they show you how to write apps or application programs that run on uh, the operating system. And in particular, we're gonna focus in on, on using, um, well, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate how to use C++ on Windows, but definitely uh, you can write C++ programs for any of the rest of these uh, OS environments either, okay? So what else we have here? The language of a computer, right. So here we start to get down into some of the nitty gritty, uh, some of the terminology. Um, and if you're in tech, um, it is expected when you work for, for industry, uh, when you come in as a programmer, a computer scientist, or even a, an IT uh, technician, that you do know these Latin prefixes right? K means kilobyte, M means megabyte, because when you see the specs for a different computer or a different system, uh, the specs are going to be called out using these Latin prefixes. And um, if you don't know these Latin prefixes, well, you might buy, let's say, a 500 megabyte system over a 10 gigabyte computer, right? Because, oh, well, 500 is bigger than 10. Well, that's that's just the first three digits, right? You need to know that megabyte means uh, times 10 to the sixth, right? Which is equal to a million. Gigabyte means times 10 to the ninth, which is a billion, right? And it goes all the way up to zettabyte, uh, which is times 10 to the uh, almost, uh, what is that? Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21. Okay. Um, so yeah, it would probably be a good idea if you don't know these Latin prefixes to, uh, to know them, okay? All right. Um, the next page basically talks about the evolution of programming languages and um, be glad that we live in the age that we do uh, because this is what programming languages used to look like. It was purely in binary. And um, you had to know that each one of these sequence, uh, and even under the hood now, uh, it, is, it is binary, but we have high level compilers and linkers that will take our code and translate it. This is called machine language to machine code, okay? But that is automated for us now, okay? But it used to be, yeah, the, the computer programs were purely in ones and zeros. Can you imagine, right? Just like the movie, The Matrix, where they, they, they see nothing but, but ones and zeros. And so then they came up with, well, let's write a high level language, well, a higher level language than this called assembly, where we have some very basic commands that specify what the actual processor is supposed to do with the data, 
right? These are things like, we'll load the data from a particular register into memory, we'll store data that is in the CPU back to memory, uh, maybe multiply. We, we, we have some data that we wanna to multiply together. So these are very low level, um, uh, very low level commands that can be different depending on the different CPU architectures used, right? And that, that's getting a little beyond the scope of, of this course, but just know that every CPU architecture has its own set of what, this is called assembly commands, right? Assembly instructions, all right? And this was definitely a step up, better, from, better than programming in binary. Um, but you'll see that when you go to create loops and conditions and things of that nature that we take for granted now, um, these loops and conditions uh, can take several assembly uh, code statements in order to create. So this was definitely a next step up, but it, uh, it took a while even to write these assembly programs. So then they said, well, can we write another higher level language on top of assembly language that's a little more human readable, a little more uh, human friendly, right? And those are called high level languages. And C++ is definitely a higher level language because instead of utilizing each one of these low level assembly commands, we can just issue a statement like this in C++ where we say, hey, take what's in the variable rate, take what's in the variable hours, multiply them together and then take that out, uh, take the result of this and put it into a variable called wages, okay? Behind the scenes of this one statement here is probably 10 assembly commands, okay? So, um, so notice that, you know, these higher level languages enable us to write nice human readable code, but even at the end of the day, even a C++ statement has to end in a semicolon, right? And, and for, for people that are new to programming, this is one of the biggest things that drives them bonkers about C++ and even Java uses semicolons to denote the end of a statement. Um, you know, we're not used to having to put so many semicolons everywhere. And so this is part of the C++ syntax, this wonderful semicolon that you will see is critical. If you do not put this, one semicolon at the end of each atomic statement, the compiler will have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, throw up a bunch of errors and you, you won't be able to run your program, okay? So programming is all about attention to detail and syntax, right? The semicolon is part of the C++ syntax and we have to put it in, in the exact right spot in order for it to compile. And we're gonna get into some more uh, we're going to get in some more examples about this uh, here in a second, but I just wanted to point out how important the syntax of each language is. Okay, and we'll see that uh, we'll see that moving on. All right. So finally, chapter one, we're getting into what a C++ program looks like, and um, <clears throat> this is what's called the hello world program, where uh, most textbooks, when you are introduced to language, the very first program that you create uh, essentially says hello world or my first program, and it, it prints that output to the screen. Um, not very exciting, but it proves that you can create a C++ program, right? So the question is, okay, this looks like complete gibberish to me. What do I do with it? Uh, how, do I, how do I run it? How do I see this thing work? Okay. Um, in order to do that, um, what I'm gonna demonstrate with is something called uh, Visual Studio. And you can download Visual Studio for free uh, as long as, I think you type in Visual Studio Visual Studio Community Edition, okay? And here, click on this download Visual Studio button and um, 
you can download and install it. Might take a little bit. It is a large file. So make sure that you have enough free space. And I do think you have to reboot your computer uh, before you can use it. But I've already done all of that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and launch Visual Studio, okay? And we will see that your Visual Studio, once you launch it, looks something like this, okay? And it's blank, right? We don't have anything in, in the Solution Explorer to the left. We don't have anything in the output. So what's going on here? What do I need to do? All right, that's what a lot of students ask me, right? Because this IDE thing is completely new to them. Now, the good thing is once you learn how to use one IDE, um, it's, it's usually fairly straightforward to use all the other IDEs, okay? Um, because typically each programming language uh, has its own specialized IDE that it goes with, right? So for C++, Visual Studio is, is very uh, common, uh, is a very common IDE to use. For something like Python, it's, it's something called PyCharm. Uh, for something called Java, uh, it's, uh, well, there's several options, Eclipse, NetBeans, um, IntelliJ, okay? But all of these IDEs look like this, where you have a solution explorer and uh, some options at the top. So let's create a new C++ project. And you're going to see that in order to start playing with C++, you're always going to want to create a new project. That is how we organize our, our applications. OK, we can't just open a, a C++ file and start coding. Um, so we want to come up here to file, and we want to say new, and we want to go uh, project, file, new, project. And I would recommend make the recommendation, don't, don't do a Windows desktop, go down here to Visual C++, and you'll see there's a bunch of other options here, right? So make sure that you expand the Visual C++ option here. And this is for Visual Studio 2017, by the way. Um, I'm going probably on the next video, I will use Visual Studio 2019, okay? Just so that we can be a little more up to date. But in theory, these options should look almost identical in either 2017 or 2019, okay? But we wanna select Visual C++ and uh, General and Empty Project. And I'll show you why in a second. Uh, leave everything else default, maybe change the name to something that's a little more descriptive. Uh, I'm gonna call this Hello World because I'm not very original. Uh, you can leave the default location. Um, and then the solution name is going to be the same as the actual project name. I would advise creating this uh, check mark here, create directory for solution, so that <clears throat> essentially each app that you make is in its own directory. That is good programming practice. You don't want multiple apps in the same directory. OK, go ahead and click on OK. And here in the Solution Explorer, when it's done, you should see your project name and you should see a bunch of empty folders here because we created an empty project. All right, so now we've, we've created a new project in Visual Studio and we're ready to start, well, we're ready to create our C++ file. Okay, so in order to create a C++ file, and again, this is using Visual Studio 2017, should be the same process in 2019, but I'll verify that in the next video. Right click on source files and say add and say new item. Okay, right click on source files, say add new item and um, click on the CPP file. And typically for the, for the main file, I use the, I use the file name main. Okay, every program needs a main function where it won't run. And typically I put the, the file that has main in it in a uh, file called main. So let's click on add and we will see that um, it's created our main uh, file for us here, right? We can double click on it and it'll bring it up over here. It has absolutely nothing in it. Um, and that is a good thing because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this code here, right? 
and we are going to put it into Visual Studio. All right, so first thing we want to do is include, and this might not make sense yet, right? Because you're brand new to C++, you're brand new to programming, um, but that's why I'm producing these videos. The first thing we want to do is include any libraries that we need in order to do input and output. And notice that uh, this particular library is called IO stream. I stands for input, O stands for output, and stream basically stands for the all the, the streams of ones and zeros <laughs> that come into the input device and go out to the output device. Okay, so um, that is what, right? This is a library that, uh, that has input and output output commands, okay? And notice that with C++, if you put a forward slash forward slash here, um, that basically tells the computer or the compiler to ignore this line. And so what in industry, uh, a lot of times, this is what's called a comment, okay? And these comments are only useful for the programmer looking at and reading the program. This, this has nothing to do with the compiler. This is purely here for the human to help them understand what the next line of code underneath, underneath of it does. Okay. Um, the next thing about C++ is that we need to tell it what namespace we are in. And for the IO library, um, it uses a namespace called standard or STD. Okay. So we want to call out that we are using, uh, using the standard commands from IO stream. Okay. And you'll see that some of the newer high level languages like Python, um, they, they've gotten even more simplified than let's say C++. And you can't, you do have, you do have things called namespaces in Python, but it's a little more intuitive. Okay. So as time progresses, as we, as we come up with new uh, higher level languages, typically um, you may not, it's a little bit friendlier than uh, these goofy library names like IO stream and, and, and standard and uh, all right. So that's what those two commands do. Let's talk about this next command here, int, int main. Um, we are going to learn uh, in future chapters that uh, main is the, it's what's called a, a function. And the main function is what is always called the very first thing as soon as the application runs. Okay, so we have to declare main or otherwise the compiler, uh, you'll see that if we don't have a function called main, the compiler is going to say, I couldn't find main, there's nothing I can do, I can't, I can't make the app. Okay, so we have to make sure we have a main function uh, with an int in front of it, and we'll go into more later on what this int guy is and, and what these parentheses are. All right, inside of, excuse me, the main function. All right, let me try to get to my ebook here. Let's create the C out statement. And C out stands for, I think, console output. Okay, console output. I'm going to say hello world. You can say my name is. Maybe we'll do both. My name is Jack. Right? And notice again. A lot of these commands have to end in a semicolon. If we forget the semicolon, you're going to see all these little red lines everywhere. And you're going to notice that these red lines don't really, well, I guess they kind of tell you they're expected a semicolon. So sometimes they are descriptive errors and we'll let you know uh, what that means. But a lot of new students, they see this error and they go, expect a semicolon. Oh, here you go. <laughs> and notice that the compiler is still very, very confused. So the red lines will help you a little bit, but you do need experience before you understand 
what these particular errors mean and how to fix them. Okay, just like when you're learning a new human language, right? You can't just uh, learn French in a day, right? Um, okay, so here is our C out statement. And then I think at the end here, yeah, they want us to do a return, return zero. Okay, because uh, we'll get into this later, but essentially we said the main function returns an int or an integer, and we need to return an integer or again, the compiler is not gonna be happy. And we'll go into the, the details of all this later uh, in, in future chapters, but I wanna get you, give you a feel for what a C++ program looks like and how we can run it. Um, so once we have all the code in here, we don't see any red lines. We should be able to say build, um, build solution. And if you did everything right, you'll see the, the file name and you'll see this build one succeeded. If you do something wrong, like forget a semicolon, watch what happens, right? Does not like you at all. And it doesn't tell you that, hey, you need the semicolon on this line. It's just saying, well, I expected to see a semicolon, but it doesn't let you know <clears throat> where, okay? So definitely in the beginning, when you're learning how to program, you definitely want some examples in front of you. And that's what this book provides, okay? And you want attention to detail. When you are typing in a program, look at every single character and make sure what you're typing in looks exactly like what you see in the book. Okay, number one. Number two, to a computer, an uppercase M is completely different from a lowercase M. So if you see a lowercase m, use a lowercase m. If you see an uppercase m, use an uppercase m. You see a lowercase r, use a lowercase r. Okay, computers are, are really stupid machines and you have to really call out every single character correctly. Okay, attention to detail is everything with programming. Once you get everything to line up, without any errors, now, the next thing you can do, well, I wanna see it run, right? I wanna see it actually do its thing. So there's two ways to run in, in Visual Studio. You can hit this little green triangle up here, or I believe you can say build run, uh, or maybe it's under debug. I'm sorry, yeah, debug, start debugging. Uh, but typically I just come up here and say run, and it'll say, Maybe things have changed. Would you like to rebuild it? Always say yes. Okay, so that you can get the latest changes of whatever you did. And up, did you see it? It just ran. It just ran. It's exciting, right? Look. <laughs> and this is another thing that drives a lot of new students, uh, students who are new to programming crazy. Well, what just happened? What, what, I, I don't see any of this. And with Windows in particular, um, if you wanna actually see the output at the very end of main, add this command here, system pause, okay? Um, add system pause and then hit run, hit yes. And what you'll see is when, when you saw that blip, that was, it was basically displaying the application and the output. And then it said return zero at the end, right? So it returns zero and it closes the application. So if you actually wanna see the output, you need to add this system pause. And here we do see the output. Hello world, my name is whatever your name, whatever you want your name to be, okay? And as long as you add system pause, then it will say press any key to continue. You press a key and then it returns zero and it closes the application. Okay, so this is your first C++ application. And um, we're definitely gonna get into the details of this more as time goes on. But I wanted to give you a feel for 
<clears throat> what a C++ program look like, how to use Visual Studio in order to uh, run it and get it to work. Okay, so um, that's what this page is about, showing you your first C++ program. Uh, kind of goes into un under the hood of, of Visual Studio, right? Visual Studio is actually doing all of these things for you. It used to be that um, the IDE, well, excuse me, it used to be that on, in the command line environment, you had a separate command that you had to type in for each one of these processes, right? And it was, and you had to tell it what CPP files to look at, what files to use for each one of these different processes. And if you mistype something on any one of these processes, well, then the whole thing doesn't compile and you got to start over again. And it was very frustrating for many new programmers, okay? So that's why Visual Studio and these advanced IDEs are so wonderful is it does all of this for you, right? It provides the editor for you to type in the program. And then when you say run or build, right? Well, when you say build, it performs these actions here, okay? Remember that IO stream library we included? That is, uh, it goes out to the library, grabs those IO stream commands and links it to your program. Um, and then when we hit the play button, that green triangle, that is this, this part here, the execution, where we actually see the program run in action. Okay. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, and here's a link down here to Visual, Visual Studio. Yeah, this is a little dated, right? They're talking about 2015 here. Um, the latest version of Visual Studio community and you want community edition. I don't even think they make C++ Express anymore. Um, you want Visual Studio Community 2019. Okay. All right, uh, next page. What are we talking about here? Um, going into again, oh, well here, they're saying on our side, on the human side, we need to look at our particular programming problem we need to do some analysis. We need to design the algorithm. And then we need to turn it into code, right? We need to physically type in those C++ commands. And if all of that looks good and we hit the build button, then the compiler will be happy and we can move, we can move it through to the linker loader, execute execution, and we can see the results. However, notice that if we get to the compiler stage, and there's a syntax error. Remember, we leave off a semicolon. We use an uppercase R instead of a lowercase R. All those little things, we're going to see an error, like I showed you. And we go, got to go back to the coding stage, right? We have to correct all of those syntax errors before we can move down here and see it run, OK? That, that is definitely why, you know, when I teach for the university, uh, in order to give partial credit, um, it has to compile. It has to be zero syntax errors because if there's syntax errors, we can't get past this step. We can't even execute the program. There's nothing uh, useful that the application does. Okay, so step one is definitely getting your code to compile and that is gonna take some time and practice, okay? But even after we get our code to compile, when we run it, we're gonna see that there can be some runtime bugs where even if, the, even if the code runs, maybe it runs and behaves strangely. It's showing us output that we didn't expect. That is called a runtime error. And at that point, if that is the case, we gotta go back up here to the analysis stage and change our code and try again, right? So there's two points where errors can occur. Number one, with syntax, and that is just making sure that we speak C++ properly. And number two, maybe we ordered the logic when we wrote the logic, maybe we wrote it in the wrong order, or maybe we used the wrong keywords, or maybe you know we put the program together uh, in the wrong way, right? It still compiles, but it has runtime bugs. It has 
Uh, it has errors with the order in which those commands are typed in. Okay, so compiling the code is just half the battle. Once you compile the code, you need to run your code maybe several times with several different input to see that your program works correctly under different conditions. And if it doesn't, well, we got to go back up here to the top and um, uh, change our code. Okay, so yeah, this is a good diagram that really explains uh, the circular process of programming. There's no, even after 20 years of, of coding in industry, I can tell you the very first version of the program that I write that compiles uh, will have bugs, no doubt about it, okay? The very first time I run those applications, for sure, there will be some bugs here that I will need to go back and correct. So you can see that programming is an iterative process. There's this idea that programming is like the movies where you see fingers flying and, and they crank out a hundred lines of code that work flawlessly as soon as they hit the run button. That is complete baloney, okay? Um, never be afraid to try different things. Always make sure that you thoroughly test your program because I guarantee you if it's version one of the code, you're gonna have bugs. I would even say, you may even have bugs all the way up to version 10 of your code, right? You need to thoroughly test your program at this point. And once all tests pass, then you have a good application that you can release, okay? So programming is very much a circular iterative process. Do not get frustrated when you have syntax errors or runtime bugs or errors. That is completely normal. Right? You just got to go back, fix, rinse, wash, and repeat. Okay. All right. And then they show us some more examples down here. Um, notice that, um, at least in chapter one here, they're trying to get us to think uh, like a computer, where when we design a program, for instance, we want to design a program to find the perimeter and area of a triangle, we need to think in single atomic statements, okay? Meaning that each statement should do one thing well. We don't wanna to try to calculate the area and the perimeter at the same time, right? We wanna write one statement that finds the perimeter using the perimeter um, formula right, two times the length plus the width. We, when we wanna write one line that finds the area, which is the length times the width. And the other thing I will caution against here too, is a lot of these computer science books like to use uh, mathematical examples. Um, and for some students, um, uh, the math scares them. Um, please know that uh, there are plenty of applications plenty of, of, of computer programming applications that, that need minimal math, or I would even say no math at all, okay? Uh, definitely at, at an embedded level, at, at, um, if you're writing C++ for robots and let's say uh, electronics that do things, 100% math is gonna be involved. If you are writing a, a database application that is sorting and searching data and presenting that to the user, right? AKA Google, things like that. Um, math maybe isn't present at all because you're just searching and sorting the data. So if you see a math example and it intimidates you or you're not comfortable with it, please um, feel free to, uh, to move on to the next example. Okay, and hopefully there's more than one, more than one example uh, that that maybe doesn't involve some math. Okay, but in this case here, uh, this is the perimeter. This is the area, um, and we need two statements 
in order to calculate the perimeter in the area. Okay, let's talk about uh, example two here. Well, they basically want us to calculate the state sales tax and the city sales tax. And those statements are easy enough. However, we're gonna learn later on that there is a, and you're not expected to know how to do this off the top of your head right now, okay? In chapter one, they're just throwing a lot of examples out here that kind of show you, give you an idea as to what it is that these programming statements will look like. And notice that this is pseudocode, right? There's no semicolons on the ends of these statements. This isn't even C++. This is just pseudocode. We're trying to take the requirements of this program and break it down into single atomic statements that will help us accomplish what it is that, that is stated up here, right? So it tells us how to calculate the sales tax. We're doing that here for the state. It tells us how to calculate the city sales tax. We're doing that here. And then um, the luxury tax. Now notice that luxury tax is a little bit different because we only do luxury tax if the item is a luxury item. Again, this is pseudocode. This is not, this is not what you would type in a C++. But the beautiful thing about pseudocode is we can take this and we can translate it to any language out there, okay? And I'll show you later on how we can design programs using pseudocode and then translate it into C++. Uh, but what they're trying to get you to do here in chapter one is to kind of think in pseudocode, ter in pseudocode terms and start to kind of write down uh, each step of the program and what it needs to do and then maybe translate it into to pseudocode. I have seen some programmers that um, they, they will just write these items like this uh, within their code. Remember the, the, the code comment that I showed you? Uh, they, will, they will literally write all of these steps in code and then they will translate each one of these steps to whatever language it is that they are, are using. Okay, here's another example, right, where we're calculating salaries and uh, some of the logic that is involved in order to calculate salaries. Again, this isn't C++ code, this is pseudocode, but they're trying to get you into that mindset, right? How do we take these high level requirements and break it down into finite statements that will help us uh, accomplish those requirements? Okay, lots of examples, uh, lots of examples here that, that do that. Okay, um, I do like this uh, uh, table down at the bottom here uh, because they, they show you, well, if the pseudocode is this, get the length of the rectangle and C++, that translates to C in. Remember how we saw the C out statement? Well, we're gonna learn later on that there's a C in statement that allows us to take input from the user, right? Allows us to get the length of the rectangle from the user. Same with the width. We can do a C in statement with C++. Calculating the perimeter and area, it looks almost identical to the pseudocode above, right? But we add the semicolon at the end. Um, and so the beautiful thing about the pseudocode is we can translate this to any language out there. Right. If this were Python instead of C++, we would use the keyword input instead of CN. So as long as we can get our mind uh, utilizing pseudocode when we think about these problems, and it's not it's not required. Some people do better thinking in a concrete language, but eventually, once you program with enough languages, you'll see that you're going to start to think using pseudocode because th this is. This is the real algorithm. This is the logic. This is just how it's translated into a specific language. Okay. Okay. So that that uh, subunit of, of chapter one was a little bit lengthy. Uh, let's see if we can keep going here. Um, they briefly mentioned programming methodologies, uh, and there are a couple of different approaches, right? We have an object-oriented approach and something called a structured uh, approach. Um, and I believe later on in the book, they're going to get way more into object-oriented programming. Uh, 
the beginning of the book is going to focus more on the structured approach. Okay. So let's talk about the structured approach on the next page. Um, that is basically where we we look at each each problem or each uh, program requirements, right? And we say, okay, can we break down those requirements maybe a little bit more? Um, and and then we focus in on each one of those steps individually and figure out the pseudocode or the logic that should go with each step individually, right? So we're thinking on a, uh, in a functional way where we're, we're breaking down the problem into, uh, into a recipe, right? With a list of steps. And then maybe some of those steps are a little bit involved and we break those out into a further list of steps. That is what's known as structured or modular programming. Okay. Um, object oriented programming on the next page. We'll get into that a little bit later. And um, for people that are new to programming, it's a little bit, it's a little bit strange because, you know, writing out the steps, let's say a recipe or the steps to accomplish whatever it is that you need to do is fairly intuitive. When you're talking about object-oriented programming, now all of a sudden we are writing code that represents, uh, that represents objects. And each object uh, has actions that it can do. All right. And, um, and each object also has data, okay, that is associated with it. Right, so these, these are what's called the member attributes of the object, and these are the operations of the class or object. Um, so that's another way. So just know at this point, there's a structured way to make uh, programs, and there's an object-oriented way to make programs. Definitely the first half of the book focuses in on structured programming. And for most of my intro courses that I teach, um, intro to programming, it looks at the, the structural uh, way. Uh, Object-oriented typically doesn't come in until the advanced uh, programming courses or the second programming course of that language, okay? Uh, next page talks about standard C++. Well, there's a bunch of different flavors of C++. Definitely the, the, the latest uh, one that, that most people follow is, is the ANSI ISO standard C++. And really, for, as, a, as a programmer, um, you know, uh, basically the IDE, like Visual Studio, takes care of that and utilizes whatever the latest and greatest standard of C++. Now, if you get into some legacy applications in industry, they may, the legacy applications or the old applications may use a different form or different version of C++. And in those cases, yeah, you do need to uh, download that specific flavor of C++ and, and use that specific flavor. Um, but this book here uh, focuses in on the ANSI ISO standard C++, and that is definitely industry standard, what most applications uh, use. Okay, but it is a little bit dated. I'm not sure. I, don't, I, I believe it's uh, beyond version 14 for sure uh, right now. Um, all right. Uh, here's a nice quick review of everything that was stated in that chapter. And um, I will say these exercises, particularly the the uh, programming ones down here uh, are, are good practice and the odd numbered ones uh, do have solutions available. Um, and so um, if you if you want to go through those, I think that would be a a good idea. Um, but at least and maybe, the next video, I will go into 
some of these and make sure that uh, you're comfortable with at least the odd ones that have the answers available. Because one of the one of the things about programming, a lot of computer science courses teach you how to write code before you know how to read code. And that is very strange to me. I believe you should be able to read code before writing code. So when you, you know, when you see an algorithm like this, um, and notice that even these questions focus in on the pseudocode. Well, this is pseudocode. This is actual C++. We know that because it's got a semicolon at the end. Um, so really for chapter one, they're just making sure that you can break down a problem into single atomic statements that are executed in order top to bottom, right? If we need to uh, solve this problem, well, first we got to get the radius. Once we have the radius, now we can use it to calculate the area. Uh, once we have the area, well, now let's get the price from the user and then we can calculate the price <clears throat> per square inch. So learning to think like a computer and break down each one of these problems into single atomic steps or statements that are executed in order uh, is definitely very important. And you can see as some of these exercises get a little more complex, instead of let's say four statements, you might need nine, 10 statements, right? Um, Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, I hope you find this video useful. Uh, please uh, continue to provide feedback to me. Uh, either leave a, a comment uh, on my on the YouTube channel. Uh, well, it's probably the easiest way right now is to just leave a comment on the YouTube channel. Let me know if I skipped over something that uh, that you'd like me to explain further, or just just feedback in general uh, is always nice. And then uh, I will continue to produce these uh, as I can. So have a great rest of your day and enjoy your time with C++.